worth 200,000 now, but in six months' time, it's going to be worth 220. The, the phrase that we have when we're teaching our, our network of people to put comparables together is, we're not looking for perfect, we're looking for best. Mm. You're listening to the Source Property Podcast, your number one source of tips and tricks for starting your property business. Hi, my name is Chris Kirkwood and welcome to another Source Property Podcast. This week, the podcast is titled The Secrets of Property Valuations with Ryan Stevens. And I'd like to welcome Ryan to the podcast. So hello, Ryan, and welcome. Thank you very much. So the reason that we chose this is we get questions all the time from people within our network, from people uh, from outside of our network about finding deals, identifying deals, and then putting the research together to show that you are going to make money out of that deal. We've just had a, a brief conversation outside, and one of the things that you said about valuing property, which I thought was really interesting, was about the art of the valuation. So I've got a series of questions that we're gonna ask you, and I think this is gonna be a really, a really interesting, and also a really very valuable podcast if you're interested in doing property. So um, do you wanna just give us an overview as to sort of uh, your business and your daily activity? Uh, yeah, so I, I'm a chartered surveyor. Um, I specialised in, in doing commercial property valuations, uh, but by commercial that sort of means any, uh, anything from traditional retail office, industrial, um, hotels, bed and breakfasts, serviced accommodation as people probably know it, uh, HMOs, that sort of thing. Um, so that is that is my day job. Um, also a chartered arbitrator, uh, which means that I do commercial dispute resolutions. Um, where landlord and tenants can't quite agree on things like rent reviews or lease renewals. Um, so they come to me and I tell them what the answer should <laughs> should be or is going to be. Um, and when you give them that answer, they have to stick to it? Uh, yes, it's contempt of court if they don't. Um, so I'm, basically arbitration is one level below a judge. Mm -hmm. uh, it's above an adjudicator, below a judge. That's, that's the... And what, looking at the valuation specifically, uh, how's business at the moment? Um, yeah, I mean, steady away. People are buying stuff, you know. Um, the the bank lending side of it, I don't do any more. Um, stopped doing that about six months ago. But you know, speaking to colleagues and everything, things are still you know, still going through, still mm -hmm. trudging on. Um, the, the banks are starting to tighten up a little bit. Uh, I was talking to a couple of bank managers about my personal stuff a few weeks ago, um, and you know, they are starting to sort of just just understand things are you know head starting to slow up and, and, and stick around a little bit so uh, the, the banks are starting to adjust their criteria uh, for the commercial stuff so that's a really that's a really interesting question to start on so it, if the market's moving whether it's moving up or down um, and lenders are, are changing their appetite for different levels of risk involved in property uh, valuations how much of that is communicated to the valuer because obviously the valuer and the, the lender are not necessarily linked in any way. Mm -hmm. So in, in uh, valuations for lending, how much of an influence or how much does the valuer understand about the appetite of the, the, of the lenders yeah. in the market? Um, I mean, we shouldn't, we, you, don't, you generally don't trouble yourself with the appetite of that individual lender. So if you're doing a valuation for Lloyds, for example, you, you don't start looking at their product list and you know start, uh, what you have to have a broad understanding of is an appetite within quote the market mm. um, it, what you're asking effectively uh, is a relatively technical academic boring question in that it's the link between what we do on you know the the 10th of may if i go out and value a property mm. what's happening in the market and uh, and so in terms of transactions and and how do we sort of relate that because you know all comparable evidence for, is is historic mm -hmm. and how does that old evidence translate to today's valuation mm. you know and what might have changed with bank of england base rates going up say in the past six or nine months you know how do I, if i've got a piece of evidence that's 12 months old how, how useful is that mm. you know to, to today's market the lenders themselves don't put any you know certainly the, the you know the the type of lenders i work the you know the commercial lenders they don't put any pressure or influence on sort of how how we do things they just sort of say well you know, you're the professional crack on with it 
and um, and that is just how powerful you are <laughs> right it, it it still it sort of blows my mind how powerful val, uh, valuers are when they're especially value when they're creating evaluation for lending purposes mm. they essentially dictate whether that deal goes ahead or not and it's all on their shoulders and as you as you just said that the lender doesn't have any well, doesn't have much influence at all on the on the on the valuer so it's all on them yeah with putting you know confirming those numbers mm. and di therefore dictating whether that deal goes ahead yeah yeah absolutely uh, you know we, we are there as a, as a relatively final check and balance for, mm. the, for the for the lending institution um you know not necessarily the final check and balance that will probably be the underwriter you know, the, the underwriter will probably press the button mm. for the money to go out the door um you know, and there's a whole other, a whole other thing as to how you know valuers and underwriters interact and what have you. Um, but yeah, we are certainly one of the few people. You know, it's not it's not like the very you know the very old days before. Uh, I don't know how old you are, but you don't seem that old. You know, before we were around, you know, the, the bank manager would go out to the property. Yeah. In in the fifties and sixties and what have you, you know, in, in his in his trench coat and he'd come and look at the property and it'd be like, yeah, thousand pound or two, you know. Two, whatever it two, was then two thousand yeah. pounds uh seems about right i'll i'll i'll, I'll you know I'll, I'll tell the girls in the office it was you know uh, to, to write the check yeah uh, and that would have been it um you know obviously we yeah we are we go and see the property we go and you know look look for problems basically um and, and so yeah we we have to be it's incumbent on us as valuers as surveyors to tell our client the bank if if indeed we're acting for the bank what the property's worth, what the positives and negatives might be, all that sort of stuff. Um, but then it's it's equally incumbent on your clients, you know, or indeed property investors in general, in my opinion, to have already basically done that work in advance. And this is why I always try and stress to people that, you know, finding, making sure you, you have solid comparable evidence. I, I, I harp on about this in any talks that I do. Comparable evidence, it's the backbone of valuations. Yeah. Okay, um, and the amount of times people ask me, "Oh, well, if I'm buying a property and I can't find any comparable evidence, mm. what, should, what should I do?" Oh, it's a bugbear, right? Yeah. It's, it's it's like it's red rag to a bull. Yeah, we get yeah. that a lot. Yeah. There are no comparables for this. Yeah, don't buy it. <laughs> just just don't just don't do the deal. You are risking a lot of money. A lot, of, many many you know, tens, hundreds of thousands of pounds, depending on you know millions of pounds, what depending on how big your deals are. Um, you know, if there are no comparables, especially you know when you're looking at the GDVs, the, the gross development values, if you cannot substantiate to yourself the property is, should be worth mm. X, then how is a valuer going to do that? The valuer has to evidence comparable evidence. Yeah, the valuer has to evidence that, that the property you know is is worth X. If they can, if they cannot do that to their client who's going to be lending many hundreds of thousands of pounds, millions of pounds then they're not going to they're they're not going to help you out they don't care if you can't pay your investors back they don't care if you can't pay your bridging company off yeah um you know we have to be diligent and reasoned and rash and, and rational using evidence there is a little bit of a, as you into that there is a bit of an art to it there is a bit of subjectivity but that's intertwined with the objectivity of the evidence yeah so if you didn't understand why valuers are such uh, a, a, an important person to you if you're looking to get a, a property deal across the line, the first part of that answer is exactly why. The second part of that answer was all about comparables. So let's look in look at look at that in a little bit more in a little bit more depth. Mm -hmm. So let's just take a normal a normal residential property or a you know a flip, mm -hmm. you know, um, just something a bog standard deal. Yep mistakes that people make most of the time in, in finding those comparables is there any are there any common mistakes that people make when they're when they're putting their comparables together yeah i think the first one and again this, this tends to come right at the beginning when they are looking at the deal um is let's say for example like, like we have been up until you know let's say nine months ago when the interest rate started we were in a, a relatively rising market it wasn't going mm. crazy like 2005 six but you know things were trotting up and people make the mistake of thinking ah oh, well it's it, you know i think it it'll be worth 200,000 now but in 6 months time it's going to be worth 220 mm. just by virtue of the market rise yeah 
Do you, re- do you remember watching Sarah Beanie, her <laughs> programme around that time? Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how, how the, I got into property, yeah. Was it really? So yeah. the, the thing that she used to say uh, 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 at the end of every programme was like, Colin and Marjorie made £30,000 from this property. Mm. However, they made £30,000 from this property because the value went up in the time that they owned yeah. it. And <laughs> yeah. that was always the caveat. that, yeah. that like, They'd done all the wrong things because yeah. Sarah hadn't agreed with anything, which yeah. is, you know... Um, why it was so good to watch it but because property prices were going up so quickly people mm. were still making the money yeah um, so that that is one thing is people sort of rely on the market bailing them out a little bit yeah um, and even, even not necessarily even bailing them out but they always think they can make that bit of extra profit mm. by by just by virtue of the, the market going up and as, as we are learning now that that doesn't always happen you know the market is very much topping out and, and then some places starting to you know taper off a touch mm. um, so yeah th- that that is one big big mistake uh, the other thing is as I've already start sort of half into that is you know just not having good quality comparables genuine pr- properties that look and feel and are the same size etc as your property yeah. So no matter what it is, it doesn't matter whether it's a two up, two down mid terraced, you know, or, or a five bed house or a you know nine bed mansion or you know or a, or a, an industrial property, a retail, an office block, whatever. You need to have a good body of evidence. Four, five, six pieces that are relatively recent. Now, how recent is you know maybe you know up, up for debate if it's a two up, two down mid terraced. Some of the banks do put re- restrictions on, say, for example, it's got to be within the last six months. Okay, and that's just a lender requirement because that's sort of broadly based on how they borrow, how the banks themselves borrow money, um, and so th- those restrictions are in place for commercial properties. It, you know, we can, valuers can go back two years without too much trouble. Um, you know, and again, geographic area. Some banks on on the smaller stuff may say a quarter or a half a mile radius. Um, again, big you know shopping centres, for example. The north of England isn't out of the way to find the compar you know, to conf- to find the comparable mm. for a shopping centre. Yeah, um, horses for courses. What I really like about all of this is is the the lack of black and white. You know, oh, it, yeah, it, no. it's all so subjective, mm. um, and. It would be really easy if you could if you could say well within a quarter of a mile within the last six months within 10 percent of the size of the property yeah. and roughly the same condition yeah. it would be absolutely perfect if you could say that and that was absolutely accurate across the board because mm. then you there, there is no need for this kind of podcast and anybody yeah. can put, <laughs> put together absolutely yeah. fantastic comparables. but if you, if you can find you know again let's just use go back to the premise of the two up two down mid terraced you know mm. box standard property then if you can find a good number, it's not just about one. Mm. So it's about finding a good number of comparables that do meet that criteria. Then you're on to a winner. That is when I'd say happy days. You you you've sort of helped yourself out there. Mm. Um, you know, it, it's when things do start to deviate. It's, it's how much deviation do you go before you start to think? You know, I, I, I've I've probably too you know too far removed now from my property across the you know because for, for ver- maybe for various reasons across the half dozen comparables yeah. that I've got and then you start to think well this is looking a bit sketchy this this is not looking nailed uh, nailed on like maybe the, the the ones that were just sort of you know in the in the ideal world where pigs start to you know sort of float across the sky sort of thing the 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 phrase that we have when we're teaching our our network of people to put comparables together is we're not looking for perfect we're looking for best mm. and you have to be able to look at that that list of four five six properties and say these are the best comparables across the board taking into consideration size and condition yeah. and um when when it was sold and location mm. you have to be able to put the best together and from that best you can then extract yeah. be it an average be it you know cherry picking one particular price yeah. um you have to be able to extract the best price for your comparable from yeah. that do you think that taking that into consideration and leading on from that do you think that it's the desire to get the price that people are looking for from their comparables so leading in thinking 
I need this property to be valued at 140 grand to make this deal work. Therefore, I'm going to go and find comparables that justify 140 grand. And having that perspective, rather than going into the comparables thinking, I need to find the best comparables, and therefore having a more pure perspective when they go yeah, into it. Do you possible. think that's, that's what skews it? Yeah, possibly. I mean, the, the, one, the other thing I was going to say is, is people thinking they can smash the, smash the top of the market. <laughs> all the time uh, yeah all the time and that also translates through to things like rentals as well and it, and it is especially a problem um, when you're doing things like HMOs yeah and people you know the, the let's say the market in, in town X is £100 a week per, 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 per person or per room whatever um, and then the, the, the applicant comes along and the, you know, the mortgage applicant and says oh, I'm getting 125 it's like wow okay that is a strong jump you know, uh, and the the thing is, they very well may be um, at that particular point in time, but it's it's being able to justify that that is a sort of, you know a, 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 a something that can be maintained. Can you continue? All right, you might have seven people at this point in time who are, who are happy to pay twenty five percent more, you know, than than the market would suggest. But it, it's really hard to justify again with comparables um, that. The twenty, you know, a twenty-five percent jump, mm. uh, and that, that that also does sometimes t- tend to happen when you know when you're doing flips. Mm. So people do these houses up and the granite worktops and marble floors and gold taps and everything, and, and you know it's a two up two down mid terrace in 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 a, in a coal mining village, yeah. and, you, and you're like, wow, this is, uh, uh, you, you've you've gone over the top here. Um, you know, it, it, it's not probably not going to be worth. Seventy-five thousand pound more than every single comparable on the street. Yeah. Um, every single thing that you say, I, I just keep thinking of questions to ask you. So it's like becoming torturous not to just jump <laughs> in and keep asking you questions. But I know that that would just mean it would be flying all over the place, and that really wouldn't help. So the uh, let's take the granite worktops. Mm-hmm. Um, if somebody is going to put a, put a, put a deal together and they're looking for you to provide not only a, a, a you know a valuation for what they're going to buy, but also a, a, an understanding for what the GDV, that mm-hmm. end value, could be as well. Yeah. Um, how much information do you want about the finish, about the products that they're gonna put in there? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, it's, <clears throat> it's almost like a get out answer as much as possible. Mm-hmm. If you have a full spec of works, great. The next best thing would be artist uh, artist renders or architect renders, mm-hmm. you know, just visualizations, that sort of thing, uh, and or um, examples of previous projects. So if this is the fifth one you've done, and you've done all the previous ones as near as damage to the same standard, mm. uh, then that's great because uh, you can just say, well, okay, well, you know, this is this is what I'm going to do. You know, I'm I'm going to put these this these shaker style worktops in. Mm. Uh, you know, this this kind of granite granite worktop, blah blah blah. Um, you know, uh, there's going to be this sort this style bathroom, etc. Yeah. Um, happy days. I'm you know, as much as just as much as possible. A bit of a sort of an Excel Excel spreadsheet, just with you know te- two dozen lines on of, of new carpets paint, <laughs> painted, replastered. Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably, you know, that's <clears throat> probably the worst case scenario, as it were. So, so when you were doing valuations for lending purposes, and um, potentially you were being asked to to come up with a GDV mm-hmm. valuation in there as well. So I I turn up, I let you into the property. I'm gonna I'm always gonna turn up. I'm always gonna meet the valuer. Right, because I want to not only give you the information for my granite worktops and the mm. types types of taps that I'm going to put in there, but I also want to give you my um, the comparables that I found. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I put all that information in there. Yeah. Do you appreciate me putting the comparable stuff in there? Do you appreciate that stuff, and do you look at it, or do you take the granite worktop information, take all of that, use that because that's relevant, and then all the G, all the the comparable stuff you just put in the bin because you've got to do your own research <laughs> yeah right there are there are two linked answers to this do i appreciate it absolutely right at the end of the day the, the one mistake people do make when it comes to giving valuers information any sort of information uh, and especially when it comes to comparables is they think they can put an address and a price and that's it that's, hmm. good, that's good enough and it's yeah. definitely not uh it, it's just by you know um RICS guidance know, inf- uh, uh, va- you know, comparables in real estate valuation. Okay, go and download it. Go, you know, anyone who's listening, go go and download that 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 guidance note. Okay, it's 
about 40 odd pages okay it's not light reading okay but within that there is literally the surveyor's how-to guide of how to present comparables it's for it's for surveyors okay but if you, if you are giving it to a surveyor be helpful okay and sort of give them the answer don't just put you know one two three acacia avenue 300 grand that's yeah not, that's not helpful yeah. um you know, you know it, as a you know you need to know okay well th one two three acacia avenue was a th three bed semi you know blah 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 uh, this is the link mm. to it you know etc cetera, etc cetera. um and so it, it's all about providing a, a sort of good quality information to the valuer that that's the thing um and also you've got nothing to hide have you there's no reason to say like one two three acacia avenue with 300 grand or whatever it is mm. if you've if you have gone into finding that comparable with the perspective of you are looking for the best comparable mm. you would provide a link to that property you would provide as much yeah. information as you can at the end because of the, you what you've it, already proved as long as it's the best as long as the information is verifiable okay then it kind of doesn't matter where it comes from yeah the, now for example if if there's a property that you say that let's say let's say you know next door sold a few weeks ago might not be on right move yet uh, online registry yeah okay again thinking back to our two up two down mid terraced example that property possibly probably won't be on right move yet mm -hmm. uh, on land reg and it won't then pull through yeah okay put the information of the agent mm -hmm. who sold it chris smith mm -hmm. You know, XXX estate agents, this is Chris's phone number, this is Chris's email address. He can verify that this property sold for £300,000, okay? Yeah. It is not me just saying it, uh, you know, and, the, and so, you know. However, I will caveat all this by, you know, you, you, the question you asked me was, do I appreciate it? Yeah. Okay. Whenever people ask me this question, you know, it com comes up fairly often, um, you know, that you always get the inevitable oh I tried doing it once and the surveyor t said he'd do it well you know tough luck you know the surveyor didn't want it or said he, said he wouldn't take it for whatever reason um, yeah you ain't gonna win it all kid yeah it's just you know sometimes that's going to happen uh, you can't the, the surveyor will not uh, op with open arms accept it for whatever reason it may be just a, a weird internal company policy that they've got if, you know mm. um, it may just be the surveyor thinks he or she knows better whatever um, but so, so long as you follow the right process and you've got into the finding those comparables with the right pr perspective mm. then you're probably going to end up with fairly similar prices anyway right yeah exactly um, the one thing I always <coughs> advise people to do and again it, it may or may not make any difference whatsoever because again if you get a, a, a surveyor who's sort of adamant they're not going to listen to you at all in any way shape or form but you know you can get one's on the other end of the scale um, who are quite willing and receptive uh, to being given a start for 10 uh, email it email it to the surveyor okay because best case scenario control and C control and V copy paste yeah that's what's going to happen okay because what they're going to do is they're going to look and they're you know going to verify this and this, yep I can see on right move this did sell and yeah it's, it's, exa it's exactly what the vent you know what the applicant told me excellent i'll use that that mm. go, that goes in the report and that one goes in the report and before you know it you've got your evidence because um to back that up as well the conversation that, or the chat that we were having just before we came in came in here to record this um you said that it, it, it's quite feasible that evaluation is going to take you a couple of days to put to put together yeah. so if you if you email it to the to the valuer you know, just because at that moment that I met you at the property and you've said, no, I don't want that stuff. Mm. That doesn't mean that that's the only opportunity that you've got because a day and a half in when you're, you know, maybe it's four o'clock yeah. and you're, you haven't brought your Snickers with you that day. So you're having a bit of a four o'clock lull and yeah. you see the email that I've sent you with yeah. those valuations in, you might think, oh, balls to it. I'll just have a quick look at them. Yeah. But it's not just that it's, it's on uh, certainly on more complex properties where you know again moving away from our two up two down mid terraced but moving into hmos hotels you know retail properties the evidence may not be 10 a penny mm. it may be a little bit more difficult to actually come across that and again especially if there are lenders lenders time scales to work to you know if you've got a five day sla to, to, to get the value you know once you've been out to inspect some lenders Im impose a, a five-day service level agreement yeah. to, to, to send the report back. Yeah. Uh, and especially if you've got intermediaries, et cetera, they, they really do hound you. Um, 
and, and penalise you if, if you don't turn things around quickly. So yeah, have, having that information can can really you know having it to hand and again providing it's it's not just the the absolute bare bone basics which is not going to help anybody. Uh, you know, be, be you've, you again give that information. You sh you sh it shouldn't be too much more work because in reality, as an investor, you should have all that information before you bought the property. You've got to have had, okay, because otherwise you're going into the damn thing blind. Mm. You know, you you kind of sticking your finger in the air and hoping you know crossing your fingers. Yeah, at, at best. So you should have all that information before you bought the property. That should be you know all definable and legible and, and verifiable. Mm. Um, for your own due diligence, that's, yeah, that's the point, right? Absolutely. For you, to, yeah. to satisfy your own risk appetite or, yeah. or, or um, um, mitigation for risk, yeah, right, because um, it's your money. Yeah, again, it depends how how you go about financing things. But it's, you know, if you've already done some, you know, if you've already bought the property and then you're moving on to a term mortgage product with a another lender, then yeah, definitely you can have it. Or but, but if yeah. you, even if even if you're doing something like uh, you know. Uh, uh, current market you know market value but then doing like a special assumption like a, a gdv for example um then again you want to you want to have got a blooming good idea of what not only what you're paying for the thing but what it's going to be worth once you've done x y or z to it uh, under, under that special assumption so we've talked about sort of putting putting together comparables for fairly standard property deals but mm -hmm. you did say three little letters that are going to be uh, music to people's ears when it comes to valuations HMO okay so um, how does it differ for HMO still residential property yeah but HMO I'm sure a lot of the listeners to this podcast will know that there is the possibility of having commercial you call it something different commercial um, commercial valuations on HMOs and because of that um, we tend to have quite a lot of conversations with our with our network about not only the the pros of getting a commercial and therefore potentially a higher valuation than just the, the bog standard again I call it bricks and mortar you're going to call it something different bricks and mortar valuation um, but also the negatives we talk about the whole package how that how that entire uh, uh, entire thing looks because there is the possibility that you can get a higher valuation for HMOs mm. so do you want to Go into your understanding of that My and yeah. and and what you can teach our uh, our listeners about it. Yeah. Okay. Right. So, what I'm about to say that was a serious right, wasn't it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> what I'm about to say again is all f sort of uh, information that's out there in the public realm. Okay. Our ICS guidance know valuation of buy to let and HMO properties. Okay. You can go and download it. And it, that will tell you again how we as valuers are required to approach these valuations. Mm. Okay, so it's all, it's all information that's out there in the public realm. So, that being said, there are basically the, the the guidance note has effectively three levels, as it were, of HMOs, and the the the, the words that you were sort of knew knew that I'm not going to say you said it wrong, but. Um, uh, you, you said it different to how you've got different terminology to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, so bricks and mortar is a is a phrase I genuinely hate, uh, and and people who know me know that. Um, it's uh, quantity surveyors do bricks and mortar valuations. Okay. Okay. Quantity surveyors count the bricks. They will count the mortar. Yeah. They will say, okay, well that wall needs a thousand bricks yeah. to be built, and we need seven windows, and you know that's that's bricks and mortar. That's quantity surveying. Okay. We do comparable valuations okay okay so they are they are it is a valuation methodology okay a comparable methodology right okay you are comparing property a against property b c d e okay so that's comparable yeah the other method the, the commercial style valuation is what's called income capitalized or an investment that is turning the rent via a yield or, or a yp depends which one what you want to do uh, so turning the rent into a capital sum. Expand on, expand on YP. No, it's that is a that that is not something for a two minute conversation okay. podcast. All um, right. It, okay. It's just basically it's the it's the methodology we use to turn yeah to turn the rent to, to it's, it's the it's called the years purchase. And there you go. Okay, so years purchase. Just so we know what it means. Yeah. Okay. Um, so it's the it's the years purchase. So it's the opposite of the yield. Yeah. The, the inverse of the, of the yield. Okay. Um, so. We, we turn that rent into a capital sum, okay? And that's a commercial style valuation. Okay, yeah. All right. So 
the three layers, as it were, or the three sort of levels that the RICS guidance note talks, you know, sort of tells us about is first of all the com the, the comparable yep. style valuation, yeah, and that is basically small H, you know, small HMOs in areas where there is not necessarily an active market, not necessarily for renting, but for HMO investments. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, it may be that minimal works have been done to convert it you may put locks on doors uh, and if it's a three bed H, you know three bed minimo for example as some people call them um, then you're probably not going to get you know you're going to be you're almost definitely going to get a, com a comparable mm -hmm. valuation okay okay the neck the, the opposite end of the scale so I'm going to skip the middle for a second okay the opposite end of the scale is the pro are the properties where you, the RICS recommends that we would almost you know inevitably do a income investment valuation? Okay, so these are properties in in cities more often than not where there is probably an Article Four directive. Mm -hmm. The property is probably sui generis planning, i.e., it is a large HMO. Mm -hmm. And most most importantly, and again, I can't stress this enough. There is a there is evidence of an active market for HMO investments, and both of those things uh, contribute to that, right? Because if you've got a sui generis HMO, it means it has to it's had to have gone through full planning to yep. create it. Yeah. If you've got it in an Article Four area, it's unlikely you're going to be able to replicate that without you know yep. somebody else having a being able to say yes or no to it. Yeah. And therefore, that's why that 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 adds to that investment market yeah because you can't just buy the property next door and then replicate it the the property next door <clears> test <throat> is is something that is in the guidance note mm. that the, what we're talking about when in if you think about it in economics okay if you're talking about article 4 directives and sui generis planning and all that sort of stuff that they are what are called supply side limitations mm -hmm. okay you are restricting the supply of a particular product this product being HMOs and the, the the house next door test is literally in the guidance, the RSCS guidance. Now, can I, as a punter, as an investor, go and buy the house next door, which may be equal in size or as near as damn it? And if you are offering your ready-made HMO investment for three hundred grand, for example, if you're telling me as the valuer your house is worth so it's, it's producing thirty grand a year in income, and you say it's a ten percent yield, three hundred grand, okay, hypothetically. Can I, as a punter next door, go and buy the house next door for 150 grand and spend 75 grand doing it up and end up with the same thing? Mm. Okay, so I've spent 225 all in. Why, as a reasonable punter, would I buy yours for 75,000 pounds more? Mm -hmm. And that's the acid test ultimately when it really boils down to it. <clears throat> so, therefore, is the um is the investment market the most important out of those three car absolutely yeah so even if it's not in an article 4 area and it's not sui generis if there is an investment market there mm -hmm. then that's still compelling evidence for but you to give it an investment valuation so that's that's where the middle bit comes in okay the, of those three of the three compa definitely comparable definitely investment mm. that's where the middle bit comes in um, and it's sort of how many of those things do you take away before you start deviating between you know you, you can only really do one or the other now you may say for example if you've got a property where there's no article 4 um, and there's a sort of semi-active investment market but it's but it's got sui generous planning for example yeah you may say okay well I'm going to do a comparable valuation but I'm going to add on a percent and then again it's, this is all in the guidance now I, I'm going to add on a bit for, for example, for the fact that it's it is a large HMO and it's been sort of extensively converted. Yeah. And we as valuers acknowledge that you know it's not entirely unpainful to deal with contractors. Um, <laughs> says through gritted teeth. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's not entirely unpainful to deal with contractors and and sort of providing that product has has a, has had some added value. Yeah. Um, you know. So it may be that the pro the the underlying property is worth two hundred grand, um, and it you know you say okay, well I'll add, I'll add twenty five grand on again just pulling numbers out of the air, but I'll add twenty five grand on just for the fact that the renovation has been done. It might not be worth three hundred, 
but you know the, the, there there is a ready-made product to, to be bought mm. uh, and somebody would reasonably buy it you know again backed up with evidence but somebody would reasonably buy that in order to generate 30 grand in income so you said that that, that valuation would be based on the yield mm-hmm. of that property so is that the yield that that, pro- that that property will generate or the prediction of that yield or is it the, the yield that is in place in that local area the second one <laughs> yeah okay. um, so it's not how much how much rent the property will generate relative to its purchase price mm. or uh, or you know purchase price plus cost it's not of that what it is it's if this property were to be sold what is the relationship between the sale price and the rental value okay so if it's if it's if if we think it would sell for three hundred thousand pounds and it is producing or could reasonably produce thirty thousand pounds, then that's a ten percent yield. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now that will be born in the evidence. Okay. So again, it depends. But the market will tell us what yield is applicable. Mm-hmm. So in Sheffield and Nottingham, for example, reasonably active, reasonably hot HMO markets. Okay. It may be, for example, that a yield of eight percent. Is perfectly reasonable in the in those markets for good quality HMOs, mm-hmm. okay, in in fairly central locations. Um, so an eight percent yield is is a sort of twelve and a half times multiplier YP, mm-hmm. okay. So it's just, you you would take whatever the passing rent is and multiply it by twelve and a half times. Yeah. Okay. The alternative is you divide it by zero point zero eight, and you get the same answer. Yeah. 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 Okay. And and that would and, and the way that we arrive at that as valuers, it would say we would say right, okay, we've got our comps. Comparable A sold us an eight percent yield because we know the sale price and we know how much rent was passing. We've got comparable B, we mm. do the same, uh, and so it's it's what we do is we say okay, well it's 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 sale price divided by the rent mm-hmm. will will give us the yield, and so if we've got a bod- a body of comparables with a body of yields. Hopefully, he says, that tells us a story. That gives us a tone. So then, where do you get that from? Because on on Right Move or on Land Registry, you can't specify that you're only looking at yeah. HMOs or <laughs> things that are registered as either C4 or sui generis. Yeah. No, no. So so again, this is where it becomes a little bit more difficult to find HMO comparables. Mm. Um, a, a good start for ten, generally speaking, is, is EIG, Essential Information Group, the auction website. Mm-hmm. It's a really good start for ten. You know, uh, some people sell uh, sell HMOs via that medium. Mm. Um, the th- when it comes down to it, it's it's a case of picking the phone up and sending email or and or sending emails out. Which goes back to the it could take you two days to put a valuation together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it's a case that you know, uh, it's a case of knowing people, knowing who to ask. Be sometimes even if you don't know them, pick the phone up and say, "Oh, hi, my name's Adam. You know, Adam Jones." I, I'm, you know, I've got a valuation coming up, or I'm doing a valuation of this type of property in this location. Have you done anything recently? Have you sold any? Have you sold anything? Blah blah blah. And it may be that it, it almost becomes six degrees of separation. I've found in in the sort of the fifteen years I've been doing this. Mm. It may be that the first, second, and third person, but they may bounce you on. I yeah. tended to find, yeah. uh, and especially if you're dealing with surveyors, surveyors are a lot more helpful than the estate agents typically. So surveyors will generally bounce you on. They'll say, "Oh, n- actually, no, I haven't done anything, but have you spoke to such and such?" Yeah, um, I think he might have had something, and then he, you know that person might say, "Ah, oh, no, uh, that fell out of bed," or you know the the client restrained, rescinded the instruction, whatever. Uh, have you spoke to this person? She might have done something, and then before you know it, you you, you can't even remember who you spoke to first. Yeah, <laughs> but, but you've got the answer somewhere down the track. Yeah, and that applies to any you know. Again, sh- move. Let's move traditional resi properties, which are fairly easy to value, to the side for a second. Just go get on right move. Uh, any other type of property, that is how you get comparables. Mm-hmm. Okay, and be yeah, like I say, be that HMOs, hotel, hotels, industrial estates, retail offices, blah 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 blah. blah. That is how you do it. It's um, the other thing as well, which I always recommend investors do, is listen to people, and listen to people who are saying that they are, are have or are or are about to buy the similar style of property that you invest in. Mm. Okay, because when they do do that, 
they will inevitably, inevitably or invariably get a valuation done. Okay. In the valuation report, it's a mandatory thing under RICS Red Book regulations, there must be comparables in the report. Mm. So if you're doing HMOs in central Manchester and you know that your pal who you've, or you know some person you've met at a networking event is also doing HMOs in the student area of central Manchester, then you know you probably want to ring them up and say or you know WhatsApp them. Did you get that you know the, the the valuation that you had done? Did you manage to get hold of the report? I don't necessarily need to see all the report, but the comparables page. Mm. Can I have can I have, have a copy of that? Um, because, Valuable stuff. Because you know shock horror valuers won't go and get a fresh body of evidence for every single valuation that they do because sometimes you can just reuse it. Yeah. If you've done an HMO one week and then three weeks later you're doing another HMO which is fairly close by you go in, you're just you're just going to sort of copy all that page and just plonk it across mm. uh, check it's still relevant check keep an update to see see if anything else has happened in in the interim um but yeah so so if, if you know somebody who's doing something that is very similar to your property in a, in a very similar location ask them for for not necessarily for the report it's probably a bit cheeky but for the comps page yeah who'd have thought it eh? you've been in property for 15 years and you you're, you're your evidence and the the sort of daily weekly activity that you go through still is all about people mm. it's all about getting to know people it's all about you know who, who'd have thought that if we had a pound for every time on the, on this podcast that we've said that property is a people game then we'd have at least 10 pounds by now <laughs> but it comes up a lot doesn't it, it comes up a lot that pro property is a people game and make sure that you connect with people and make sure that you get people's telephone numbers because you never know how you can help them but also they can help you yeah. at some point in the future it's a small industry <clears throat> it absolutely is. So um, the yield-based valuation or the yield-based calculation that you talk about for HMO, we actually uh, have put that calculator together and we've made that available to our network to help them out. Uh, 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 you know, because that's a lot of work, isn't it? It's a lot of work to go through previously sold properties and the amount of money that they were making and then work out the yield. It's mm. a good few hours worth of, worth of work right there, just putting those yeah. comparables together yeah. to justify the property that you're doing. Um, Let's bring it back to the uh, the normal, I'm going to say bricks and mortar. I'm also going to say comparable at the same time because uh, that's bringing both of our worlds together. Um, so with, with a normal a normal valuation, it doesn't have any kind of income mm -hmm. aspect to it. Um, it would be great if we could, and that includes, you know, whether you're doing a, um, a flip for a, a normal residential property or a commercial conversion um, you know you're still putting your comparables for those end flats together in the same way right? yep. so um, if you could just give us a, a you know a snapshot of the most important things to consider when you're putting when somebody's putting their comparables together for a, a, a normal comparable based comparable valuation yep. um, the one the one the first thing that I always or not necessarily the first thing, but the, the, the overarching thing when I'm thinking about valuations for myself, for, you know, for, for any investments that I make, um, is, is, is there a margin of comfort? Is, is there a margin of safety? You know, if the value is having a bad day, okay, you know, and it does happen, uh, if the value is having a bad day and, and sort of doesn't absolutely mess it up, but just comes right down to that sort of the bottom end of the range of your acceptability, mm. you know, how how much fat have you got on the deal? You know? All right, I can't let you go any further than that. If the valuation, if the valuer messes it up, mm -hmm. so how many, have you ever been called in to have a look at somebody else's valuation where your valuation has been completely different and having had any kind of contact with that first valuer, they've been um, ready to admit or ready to accept that on that day, you know, they accidentally fell over the dog when they were coming out the front door in the morning. And therefore that yeah. was just the start of everything going wrong yeah. in their day. <laughs> and therefore by four o'clock in the afternoon, when they've done that valuation, mm. they've had an absolute stinker and they've just not, not, you know, put things together correctly. Yeah. Um, what I'm asking is, have you seen value other valuers get things wrong? Look, nobody's perfect. Um, I can't sit here and, and say that I've never got anything, mm. you know, 
thing things go awry you sometimes don't have the time or you know you just don't find that one piece of evidence that is absolutely great yeah you know because it's all about weighting the evidence so every, all every piece of comparable evidence is not equal yeah um, so you might not have come across that that property next door that sold last week yeah uh, for a great value and it just doesn't you know just doesn't happen and again especially if on the more slightly complex property you know properties that we value um, things just go weird and especially okay. if people don't meet the value of there yes yeah especially if you, you again if you if you if you've not been given any evidence or whatever, you have to go and do that do it all yourself so I had one case um, somewhere in sort of West Yorkshire I'll not say too much and somewhere in West Yorkshire it was a few years ago now office block okay it, a little bit out of the way it's not central not not in a city or te- in your town center yeah a little bit out of the way um, fairly big office block and it was a real pig to value you know not necessarily measure up it was easy to measure up but there was no no evidence okay really hard and so it gets a phone yeah you know, do the valuation as it have it checked over by a colleague happy days send it off a couple of days later get the bank manager on the phone this is for a, a big bank Barking at me, absolutely going bananas. Uh, I've had the customer in the off in in the office. He's he's going absolutely bananas. You know, da 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 da. Why didn't you look at the um, <laughs> the office block next door that sold six months ago? I said, I, I said look, hold my hands up. I never saw it. Never never came up. I said, you know, he said, oh yeah. It, um, it, anyway, I ended up phoning the the borrower. It was an off market deal. Okay, mm. hadn't hit land registry yet. Yeah, it was right. nowhere to be found. Yeah, it was nowhere to be found at all. There was no record of this place ever having transacted. It wasn't. It wasn't uh, off on. You know, it wasn't on, on with an agent. Nothing. I said, not being funny, buddy, but why didn't you tell me about it when when I came to inspect? I said, surely, to, surely to God, that that would have helped me get to a decent answer. Yeah. Um. So I thought you'd have done all your, done all your own research. So well, I, I do, but. I, you know, I'm not going to go buying land registry titles for every. Notwithstanding the fact that I haven't even hit land registry yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I said, but you know, I'm not going to. I'm not going to go and buy, spend three quid a thousand times. Yeah. For, for, for your, you know, just for your pro, for your valuation. Um, so yeah, and, and on that one, I, I did. I changed my answer. Yeah. Be- because it was it was blazing. Now it wasn't buy a, a whole load. But it was suffi- it was a sufficient amount again to fall within the range of ac- of what the what the borrower felt was acceptable. So um, meeting the valuer there, having that information, work, looking at that as a as the an opportunity to work as a team. Now yeah. the valuer might not see it that way, and yeah. as you said, they might just turn their nose up at everything that you put in together, which mm. which is absolutely fine. Yeah. But should they have the same perspective that they they are happy to receive that information, mm. that works for everybody. And why wouldn't you try and meet them there and build a relationship with them? Yeah, absolutely. Look, you know, sometimes things are just a little bit complicated, and just having that information there is a little bit of a start for ten. Can sometimes help. All right, yeah, we've got to go away. We've got to check it, and you know, indeed, I did check that mm. uh, information and what have you. Um, but it, it always helps, and that, that's the big thing um, that, that I'd say. Um, I interrupted you because I'd asked you about the the, the sort of standard um, that people can, the standard perspective that people should have or the, or the focus that they should have when yes. they're putting standard comparables together. Yeah. And then you said something about the, and I jumped in, so apologies. Yeah. Can you remember where you were? Yeah, uh, ish. Um, I, th- I think comprehensive data, like I said, not just putting an addre- a price and an address and think that's good. So comprehensive data, mm. okay in paper form and in email form to the valuer mm-hmm. um, you know, then, then you, you're covering all bases making sure there's that margin of safety where yeah. this again that's right at the front end though making sure that, that when you're first looking at a deal you, you've got you've got that underlying okay well I genuinely think it's worth you know 125 grand a little two up two down mid terraced okay however if the valuer comes out and says 115 I'm not going to lose my shirt Mm-hmm. I can you know, whatever I can pay me investors back I can pay me bridging finance off mm-hmm. uh, whatever you're doing um, you know I, I've, I've got a little you know what, what you, the last thing you want is to be 10 grand short at the 11th hour um, and, and then be running around like an idiot oh, I need 10 grand off someone yeah <laughs> um, you know go and sort of raid your ra- 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 grand's piggy bank sort of thing um, have you been watching me? <laughs> um, uh, okay, so um, 
And would you agree with the perspective of best? When you're looking at comparables, you're specifically looking at comparables to justify the deal going ahead. Would you agree with that? It, oh, it's yeah, far absolutely. better to have, rather than say, right, that sold within within the last six months, therefore that is going to be my best comparable. Mm. Or that's that, uh, you know, or, or looking at the, being focused on the value of the property that's yeah, so, sold. So what you're talking about there is weight. The, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So that, that is a phraseology, again, that everyone probably ought to sort of start in, including in their lexicon when they're talking to valuers is weight, the weight of evidence. Mm. So yeah, have 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 a body of evidence. Have, have a what's called a basket, again, little phrases, but a basket of evidence. So that is the the you know six, seven, eight, eight, however many comps that you've got. But then effectively you rank them, and 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 what you will ultimately start saying is okay, well I've placed most weight towards the property that's that's next door. It sold last week. Mm. It's identical to my property. You know that that is the, the the best comparable, and that is that provides us with the most weight and I, I effectively the most reliance. Mm -hmm. I am pl placing most reliance on that piece of evidence. Yeah. Um, you know, and and then going down, you may place no weight on a piece of evidence because it happened three years ago and it was two miles away. Yeah. And it, you know it, it's a five bed detached as a you know you, that's slightly extreme, but you get the yeah, point. Yeah. Um, so you might place no weight on, on that piece of evidence or, or, or very little weight. Uh, this is, we could go on for ages, but the, the production team behind the cameras uh, are sort of um, looking like they want us to end here. So we will call it a day at that point. Uh, we could talk about this kind of stuff for absolutely hours. So I want, just want to say, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge and experience with everybody that's listening to this. If, uh, if, anybody listening to this wants to get in touch with you um, in order to use your services what is the best way that they can do that um, phone or email if I can I'll say that I'll maybe give you something that can be put on in post-production yeah let's do that um, just you know phone I don't have a website um, just too much faffing around <laughs> um, so yeah I'll, I'll give you my information you can pop it pop perfect we'll put it in the show notes so uh, if anybody wants to get in touch we'll put the uh, put ryan's contact details in the show notes um but really appreciate it thank you very much and uh, thanks once again for being on the source property podcast thank, thank you. you very much that's it for today we really hope you got some value from today's podcast and if you did don't forget to give it a like and a comment and be sure to share and subscribe as your support helps us to continue making this valuable content for you Remember here at Source Property Group, we're here to help you uh, drive your property business forward from training to investments, sourcing properties, leads, support, and much, much more. So until next time, I've been Chris Kirkwood and this is the Source Property Podcast. Thanks for listening. You're listening to the Source Property Podcast, your number one source of tips and tricks for starting your property business.